Please welcome Rex Chapman. Thank you. Good job, buddy. Thanks for having me. All right. All right, all right. This book, you lay it out. You are, I know you from basketball. Some people know you from social media. Uh, you have a podcast. In this book, you talk about your, your addiction, your recovery. Um, how difficult was it for you to write that? People have been telling me I should write a book for a long time. Yeah. I never really understood why. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then Seth Davis, the guy who co wrote, co uh, author who co wrote the book with me. Yeah. I've known Seth a long time. He called me up. I had a level of comfort that I don't know that I had with a lot of other people. Yeah. And we started the process. We started it probably, I was, I told somebody today, I think it was like two years ago. Yeah. It was like four years ago because yeah. about a year in, Seth said, hey man, I've got another project that's kind of time sensitive. Do you mind? I said, no, I don't like talking about this anyway. So right. take all right. the time you want. He, I said, sure, what is it? He said, well, it's Sister Jean, who's 104 years old, and I, I laughed. I said, that's the sweetest thing ever that you right. think I might outlive Sister Jean. <laughs> <laughs> right. So right. anyway, there we uh, are. Um, man, I resonated with so much of this. You're incredibly honest. One of the things that jumped out at me was you broke the rules and oftentimes the law a lot before kind of the big bottom. Yeah. I mean, there was cheating in school. There was cheating on That's your girlfriend. That's not against the law. Uh, no, right? <laughs> there was driving with a suspended license. There was breaking tons of curfews. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, every single rule time. Rule breaker. Uh, rule yeah. breaker. But then it really seemed like it all crashed in oh. 2014 when you get arrested for stealing from an Apple store. Uh, is that right? No, not you. Okay. But I mean, <laughs> by the way, I didn't just bring you out here to tell you all the gotcha. shit you did. Gotcha. Up, yeah, I'm asking a question that I should probably get to it. Uh, the perks of being an athlete and being a successful athlete, is that what allowed you to... I, I think so. Yeah. Just talking about it in the yeah. green room, really, with Larry Hughes, yeah. uh, my Simon & Schuster guy. I, my last two years of high school, yeah. I, I, I have dyslexia, and I didn't know any of that, though. Right. I just knew right. higher math and science and all that stuff. I would sort of check out, like... How are you guys getting this? This right. is not easy. And then I'm being told it's kind of common sense. Yeah. And I just kind of, I quit. I'm not going to be a math teacher. Why do I need to know this? Right. <laughs> and so that was, and then I'd, I'd cheat. Yeah. But my last two years of high school, I just left school early after lunch. And because right. I was a good basketball player, like yeah. even in high school, well, they can't afford to sit me. Right. What kind of craziness is that? But I left, and the only time I got in trouble, the assistant principal called me in one day after school. For two years, I've done this. And I thought I was in trouble. And right. he said, listen, Rex, I don't mind you going home after lunch, right. but don't be washing your car out there when the school buses are coming by <laughs> in the afternoon. Well, this also shows <laughs> so just yes. how good you were at basketball. Well. Because, you know, maybe I could put up seven points, but if I skip school, they're like, hey, Costa, you're not that good. Yeah, you but listen, that? man, you played tennis, and That's you right. played it at a very high level. That's right. Going and playing, you know, you did. <laughs> He really did. He went to Illinois and played <laughs> tennis. <laughs> and, and anybody that goes to college and right. plays a sport, right. Division I, Division II especially, right. that's all your time. That's right. I, I didn't really have the, I didn't have the, probably the capacity for the school part of it. Right. But I was having to go every day. Right. And I remember sitting in class, because it takes all your time. Yeah. And for, for me back in the day, we could only play basketball like three, four hours a day by rule. And so I'd be in a geography of Kentucky class, <laughs> sitting there. It's such a complicated class. Yeah, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> and uh, and uh, and I'd be sitting there and thinking, well, Reggie Miller, Clyde Drexler, Michael Jordan, Ron Harper, all these guys are are working out right now. Right. And I'm stuck in this class. Yeah. And it's my only avenue to get where they are. Yeah. And I have to do what is being told, you know, probably cheating on my tests weren't the best thing, but I only did that once. But, but, but as, as I read this, it, man, you worked hard. 
You know, you, I you know, you were going I was at night. By it. Yeah, but you were getting a key to the gym yeah. at night yeah. and having you and your buddy and have him uh, rebound for you. Yeah. I mean, you you might have been a rule breaker. No, but, I, that but was the, the only work. thing that I had. That was the only thing I felt yeah. like I could control. Yeah. And um, no, I, I I worked at it. I was obsessed by it. I told someone earlier. I used to wake up at midnight on the East Coast. Yeah. I'd fall asleep, wake up just in a sweat, thinking. My guy, Gerald Madkin, somebody I know out in L.A., my grade, he's yeah. at the park right now. It's right. 9 o'clock. I need right. to do some push-ups. Let me go run a mile. I'll right. come back and go to bed. Like, obsessed right. like that. Somebody's working harder, and I can't allow that. So that same um, level of commitment, that stubbornness, that anxiety over working, how do you, does that help you in recovery? Or in a way, is it like... Is it hard to it's go to recovery hard. because I'm a bad mother? I can beat this. Well, I know I can beat I this. I think that's probably the mindset that got me there. Right. <laughs> right. You know, I, I for sure went through, you know, very first when I started taking Vicodin or OxyContin, I just remember one day very vividly thinking, oh, sh sh can I cuss? Yeah, you can cuss. I think I already, I already, I already can said I say no I say all of those. Yeah. Okay. I thought to myself, oh, f shit. Right. <laughs> um, no, I thought. You played against Michael Jordan. You've heard, yeah, you've heard yeah, way heard worse it all. than all of this. I've heard yeah, it all. Yeah, yeah. But I, I was thinking, all of a sudden, you know, I, I was taking this medicine. It was saying, take it m once every whatever. Yeah. All this, and where I'm making that call, all of a sudden, one day it just flipped where that medicine was telling me when yeah. to take it. Yeah. And before I know it, oh, I was only supposed to take three today. Now I'm to four, and yeah. now I'm to five. And then I get to seven or eight, and I go, "This is an issue, man." Yeah. And I cut it down to four or five, and then guess what? Maybe an argument, or right. whatever. Right. And then like, F this. Right. And and then that was from the time I was 15 or 16 year yeah. old, yeah. though. I started having some depression and whatnot and really started coping that way then because yeah. I didn't know how to cope. Yeah. I would, well, I would sneak off to the racetrack all the time, bet horses. That was what my dad yeah. and I always did. I just thought it was he, normal. He talks a lot so, about in this book, not, yeah. you know, not just the pills, but also a horse racing. Yeah, that's my, yeah, I liked right. basketball. I yeah. love thoroughbred yeah. racing. Yeah. So, <laughs> And the only horses these people know are the ones at Central Park. Yeah. But, you know. <laughs> I like those two. Yeah. Let's talk about, because as you're talking and, you know, you, you discuss before games in high school, you always would, mm. would, would vomit and yeah. as a nerve. And then, but then you also talked about how your dad, who was a basketball coach, would do this as well. See, this wasn't, I, that, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, he used to be a coach and I would yeah. be in his locker rooms before games and he'd give his pep talk and then he'd go in the, in the, restroom, yeah. stick his fingers down his throat and yeah. throw up. Yeah. And a lot of times it was dry heaves and I just hear him in there and I, but that was how he got ready for a game. Yeah. I don't know if he did that when he played. I just know he right. did it. We never talked about but I, it, but, but then I yeah. started doing it. Right. Like I, well, I did it out of nerves. He brought his whole team to watch like a third grade game of mine. Yeah. I didn't know they were coming. I went out on the court, puked everywhere at mid court. <laughs> I mean, big throw yeah. up. And yeah. they cleaned it up. I felt like Superman after that. I was ready to go. And from that right. moment, yeah. I was a regular puker. I puked every single game yeah. from third grade yeah. till my second or third year in the NBA. And then I was just like, and I would stick my fingers down right. my throat. Right. If I was playing bad, one of my teammates might be like, bro, did you... Did Stick you? your finger down your throat, <laughs> go in there and throw up. But I'm reading this, and... I didn't I, realize that. I'm That's thinking, crazy. This is anxiety, man. Yeah, and it's it, also yeah. anxiety. Your dad had a similar situation, and when did you face that? When? Out of rehab. Oh, yeah. uh, the last right. time, for, right. 2014. Yeah. I've been clean for nine years. I'm not the model. I smoke marijuana. <laughs> I, yeah, but I use medical marijuana. Yeah. Uh, I have yeah. Coors Light from time to time. Okay. I have nine years clean from yeah. uh, opioids. Yeah. Um, I think I really started delving. I hit rock. I was broke. Yeah. I was broken. I'd embarrass myself, my family, my kids, my ex-wife, uh, yeah. all of my friends, and my 
my friends' kids that looked up to me. Yeah. Um, I, I felt like, man, you, <laughs> if you're going to live, you better start tackling some of why you do the things you do. You, 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 your, your dad is in here a lot. Yeah. Tough on you. I mean, one night time you scored 40 points, you come home, <laughs> dad's going to like me, and he was mad that you didn't play better defense. Yeah, yeah. And I played collegiate tennis. My dad, sometimes I think, you know, if he would have been harder on me, I could have oh. been a better pro. Well. And I'm thinking, well, which one is it? I don't want that. Yeah. But I also wouldn't mind me a couple more bucks playing tennis. Right. So what's the balance, dude? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know because, to be honest, I li like, I never in my life, my dad played professional basketball. Yeah. He played college. Yeah. Uh, I never in my life, my whole life, was on the floor with my dad playing basketball. He never rebounded for me. He never did any of that stuff. Also, I didn't want him to do that. I, w I was focused on what I was doing. I was watching his teams, watching everything he did, listening to everything. I was absorbing it. And I think he knew that I was, I honestly think he knew that I would be too nice if, and maybe right. fizzle out as right. a college player or whatever. Right. He knew I had the talent. Yeah. The problem is I, I did very, much similar things with my own son, right. and he didn't have the same like talent. He was way tougher than I was, right. but I treated him almost like my dad treated me. Right. Sometimes I was I was better, yeah. but still <laughs> yeah. I would. Yeah. I think that's what we're all trying to do. It's a little, hard little, balance. little better than our parents, yeah. but it's a hard balance. Yeah. And um, yeah. no, I becoming a professional basketball player was a dream come true. And I, that's the one thing. My dad, like as as it's complicated. Yeah. I love him to death. Of course. I, I appreciate everything he's done for me. My mom, the yeah. same way. Yeah. Were, are there some things I wish we'd have done differently? Yeah. Who's not that way? I mean, my mom's here, you know? And yeah. There she, there she is. And here's. Uh, and on, and on Black Woman History Night. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And uh, here's a list of things she should have done better. <laughs> um, that's a joke. That's a joke. You know that, Mom. Uh, uh, what do you have to say to people listening who might be middle school phenom in a sport or high school phenom in a sport? Everything's in front of them, it yeah. seems like. And there's a reality of this that you have lived. What do you say to somebody who might be in the throes of addiction right now? Do you have a message or a thought? Man, I, I, I guess it's really just find somebody to talk to. Uh, I, I, I had so much pride that, you know, I was this King Rex type thing, yeah. this image, and I had so much pride about not living up to anything. I had all these secret, you know, insecurities, and, you know, your pride can get in the way a lot. And once you let that, move a little bit, then you can start to see a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. However, I also recommend therapy. If I would have, yeah. if I'd have been able to have therapy, like as a teenager, 18, 19 years old, I feel like, I don't know if it would have changed anything, but I know that I had a better shot of managing the stuff that goes along with, with being a, a popular and kind of famous athlete. That's a great message. Thank you for this book. I loved it. You're the man. Rex Chapman, everybody.